Hi, everyone here and around the world. Welcome to Earth Files, where tonight we look forward to your questions and I'll try to answer before Brad's four minute bell rings. And there's more good news. This Earth Files YouTube channel has now broken through 257,000 subscribers. We would appreciate if you haven't subscribed to please click on that red button in your lower right screen. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps us at YouTube. And please click on the like button too. Hey, we're headed tonight for your questions and my answers while Brad controls that four minute bell. And let's have some fun. But first, I wanted you to know about newly proposed legislation in a bill introduced only two weeks ago on January 11th, 2024. If the bill passes, it will be the first authorization for commercial airline pilots and employees to report UFO sightings to the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. The proposed bill was introduced by the two representatives at the center of these reporters at the Capitol. Wearing a burgundy tie on the left is Representative Robert Garcia, a Democrat from California. On his right is Representative Glenn Grothman, a Republican from Wisconsin. The newly proposed bill would protect commercial pilots from punishment for reporting and talking about UFOs. After that, it's assumed the commercial pilot's UFO information could also be shared with the Pentagon. Representative Grothman called the proposed legislation, quote, crucial initiative that empowers those on the front line of our skies to contribute valuable intelligence regarding UAP sightings that can help ensure that potential threats are thoroughly investigated, close quote. Hopefully, congressional efforts to open up all the truth about UFOs and UAPs and non-human intelligences will persist and get stronger so that finally reality can be declassified. On that note, let's go forward now with your questions for the rest of the hour with Ian in England and Eric in Canada helping Brad and me in Albuquerque, New Mexico to receive your questions with Brad standing by to ring that bell at four minutes. Let's see how I do. Ian, what's first up? Thank you, Linda. And first of all, I'd like to say um, congratulations on achieving 257,000 subscribers. And I just want to let you know we're halfway towards 258,000 subscribers. So oh, keep liking wow. and subscribing us, everyone. On that note, Fluffy, you just jumped up. Maybe it's good <laughs> sign, good positive energy coming. <laughs> Go ahead. Linda, Linda, well, here's a question uh, from Hello Ali. She says, Linda, what are you most looking forward to regarding the upcoming Conscious Life Expo? And I'm going to post the links to those, those uh, conferences, upcoming conferences in the chat as well. What I look for the most always and look forward to are those discussions, whether they are up till midnight or two o'clock in the morning or walking in a park. It is where you are with people who know that we are talking about investigating, researching, and reporting about true aspects of the universe and the earth that we are on and in, and that there is no holding back. And those are some of the biggest, deepest discussions I've ever had with any humans have been, has been at Conscious Life Expo that I leave for in about a week. And I'm so looking forward to seeing a lot of you who come up to me like we're in the live matter world and you say, Linda, Linda, I watch you every Wednesday to going off with people who are there to speak or our scientists and engineers who approach and say, we want you to sit down with us because you really are on the right track and we want to give you some information. All of that happens 
at Conscious Life Expo and other conferences, but Conscious Life, and now it's 14th or 15th year, I've lost track. I've been to, I think, all of them. Because it's that vertical hotel, the Hilton, that, uh, and you go up and down between different, build, uh, different rooms where they are uh, doing all kinds of things, panels and lectures and workshops and uh, lunches and all sorts of things are happening all at once in that building. So it is an exciting energy to be trying to explore the truth of a subject that causes so much controversy when what it should be doing is opening up to all the truth about our universe and allowing humanity for the first time in history to finally start learning about the other intelligences that are not only in and in and around our system but that we are in the Milky Way galaxy which might have three trillion stars and that there is consciousness and there are other intelligences everywhere. And what a thrilling revolution I think it would finally be if we got on a planet where everyone, every person knew that the truth is we're not alone and that we're in a process of meeting and learning other people, other beings. I can't think of anything I would rather do than explore and report about this revolution going forward of humans out into the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. Did I, did I beat the four minute bell? Hello. <laughs> Was that a question? <laughs> did you get it over here? Yeah. But I didn't, did I beat the, the four? That was a question, I wasn't timing. You've got it. Oh, okay. All right. So, because it wasn't technically a question. But now, go ahead, Ian, into Q. Okay, Linda, is there anything you have completely changed your mind about in the last few years due to new information? Yes, many. At the top of the list, actually, I personally think that we are in a holographic universe. I really do think that is a big truth. And once you say that, the implication is that a hologram by definition must be projected. And if we are being projected, then who is doing the projection and from where? That goes all the way back to reading Michael Talbot's book, The Holographic Universe, and that was when Bud Hopkins and I and others were speakers at a conference, I think it was in Nebraska. And it was the same month, I believe, that the book came out. And I think it was the spring of 1993, somewhere in there. And it was a book that was being talked about at the conference with everyone. Oh my gosh, could we possibly be in a holographic universe? And Michael Talbot uh, was himself struggling with how to communicate all of this to people who didn't even understand what a hologram was. Well, Bud and I got on the same airliner and we sat next to each other. I was going to Philadelphia and he was going to New York and we were going through another airport to get to those cities. And uh, I, in fact, I think I had a copy of uh, Michael Talbot's book in my briefcase. And Bud turned to me and he said, listen, I want to tell you something, but don't tell anybody else, please. But I want you to know this. He said, Michael Talbot, the author of that book, has been one of my abductees that I have been working with for the last few years. And so Bud was saying that the whole concept of abductions and UFOs was the context for this new exciting book, The Holographic uh, Universe. And Bud uh, 
continued and he said, this is the part, don't tell anybody this, but he's been passed for a long time and, and I think this is important to share. He said, Michael Talbot eventually told me that the entire book that he was working on that has become the holographic universe was downloaded to Michael Talbot's brain through his interactions with extraterrestrials. And when I asked Bud, well, why, why would a holographic projected universe be something that the ETs would want us to know about? It's confusing. And I remember that Bud shrugged and eventually we landed and we went off into all of our different works. And I've always remembered that. And by now, 2024, I really think that eventually there is going to be some confirmation that we are in a holographic projected universe, perhaps projected and put together for a very specific reason. But understanding and getting absolute confirmation, that hasn't happened. But that would be at the top of my list. I made it. <laughs> I think that's the first one I ever made it right on the bell. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Weaver Dreams is in the chat tonight. She says she loves it when you go over the bar. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sure good. that will happen. <laughs> okay. Linda, uh, this is from X Behind Behind Blue Eyes. She says, Linda, I've been trying to ask in the light in the lives previously, what are your thoughts as to why abductions were so common for a period of time and then they stopped or slowed down? You could say exactly the same question about the worldwide animal mutilations as well. Abductions and mutilations in my own mind are two sides of the same coin. And I'm going to be doing uh, on Saturday uh, in the first Saturday of the Conscious Life Expo, what I now think of as almost a signature presentation that includes some of the most important pieces that have evolved in my own investigation and research for now almost half a century. And that the truth is that animal mutilations and human abductions have been going on perhaps for eons, but they became a, I guess you would say puncturing they, they began to puncture human reality and our consciousness, especially I think of as the 50s to the 60s. And by 1975 to 76 in Colorado and a dozen other states and beyond, there were so many animal mutilations being reported, all of them bloodless, all of them with no tracks around them. All of them where it was, if there was an examination and forensic examination, the excision, the hemoglobin was cooked, the collagen was cooked, and there was no carbon residue. And the instrument for doing this animal to animal was unknown. Also in the human abduction, paralleling that humans were alive, but they would have very interesting patterns of scars and sometimes tissue removed and other patterns. And the two paralleled each other for a long period of time. And, and then I began to see that there was seasonality, that there could be more in one county in the fall and in another county in the spring. And I began to, in my office, I actually kept a notebook for a while of latitude and longitude. I was trying to get the exact latitude and longitude for each event, an abduction, or an animal mutilation. And eventually, every once in a while, I would find some straight lines going across three or four states after the fact where I had latitude, date, and time information. And eventually, the bigger picture began to emerge. There are cycles 
on this whole planet over years. There are areas where there are repeated abductions or repeated animal mutilations, repeated beam sightings in a latitude longitude, but the cycle might be two months, two years, and that is where you have to you have to look at the granularity of it from both being high wide out and then down to a dot. And when you start dealing with the we'll call it the UFO, UAP, the whole phenomena at that level, you begin to see patterns. You begin to see towns and places that pop out where the activity is more and more in certain places. I do not have an answer for why that any more than why are we in a holographic universe if we are. Either way, both the parallels, cyclings, repeated latitude, longitudes, the earth is being treated as an entire three-dimensional huge sphere. And I think that's how the ETs analyze things. I was going to go one more sentence, but <laughs> I'll abide by the bell. One more <laughs> the abductions also cycle. They cycle. And there can be periods when you, everybody thinks it's all gone. No. They come back in cycles, sometimes reinforcing and sometimes opposite and other variations. But this is a part of the interaction of non-humans with Earth, with Earth life here. It is, it includes the mutilations, which I think are for sustenance and for genetic manipulation. And I think that the abductions are part of a huge program that may be being conducted by many different non-humans collaborating for a very specific goal genetically, of which Homo sapiens sapien is one of the beads. All right, you guys, thank you for that extra time. That's okay, Linda, I was just going to add to that about the abductions, that some people are saying that perhaps the ETs have c completed or are completing their agenda for genetic sampling over a certain time anyway, which is probably saving genetic material from humanity or completing whatever manipulation they want to do. The only thing that always comes to mind when that argument is given for me are the descriptions by the aerospace source, a military source who did work at Area 51, our buddy, the remote viewer in New York. And that is that on Epsilon Eridani, 10 and a half light years from our Earth, which is not very far astronomically, that that planet is supposed to be dominated by the trontoloid insects that are considered one of the biggest threats to the people who know that they exist on our planet. And when you come to a threat like that, that there could be populations that are threats and our, um, we'll call them our power brokers, our leaders think humans couldn't handle being told the truth that there are all kinds of intelligences and some are really a threat, but that we have allies. We have extremely skillful allies, like the tall whites, who keep them at bay. All right, why am I bringing all this up? That the reality of the relationship between Earth, Homo sapien on Earth, and other intelligences out there, whether it's 10, a thousand, a million, a billion, there are, without doubt, there are systems that have their own agendas and they would not be peaceful friends of ours or the, maybe the, not to the Nordics, the tall whites, not to anybody. So that there are hostiles. But that part of the whole matrix, whether this is a projected universe or not, is that there are also allies that are trying to help protect and bring other species along. All of this is happening at once. And that's why I think that it isn't an easy answer. There is no easy answer 
to what might be happening to the abductees on Earth right now versus what will happen a year from now, two years, 10 years. And as we evolve, I cannot believe that we can go out of this decade. That means that by 2030, for humanity to not be told the whole truth, the good, the bad, the ugly, the hostile, the friendly, all of it, it really is abuse. We deserve to be educated, not controlled, monitored, and squelched. I really feel strongly about that. And I'm curious if there are CIA, NSA, DIA, J JSOC, MI6, if, the, if there's some of you that are here tonight, I would really appreciate a private communication about your own perspective. How can a planet like Earth continue for eons with completely classified reality and nothing but really lies and that those lies are guiding our future. Thank you. I think I, I, think I, I, think I yeah. tend to speak in, 40, in four minutes. I think I think in four minute cycles. We never did that before. <laughs> we, we've seen it now, Linda. Linda, that, that leads on nicely to our next question from Mary Sue Easter Egg. Who do you think is primarily responsible for lack of disclosure? The government's private contractors such as Lockheed or the ET's visitors themselves? All three, for sure. All three in varying degrees and intensities and all three for self, um, I guess, self-evolving self reasons. I think that when Eisenhower as president, and I'm just going to say it as a declarative sentence because that's what I think is the truth, was taken from Palm Springs to a secret meeting with a non-human. The thing that is puzzling there is that some versions that some people have that seem well sourced, some think it was a Nordic which in a way seems more logical to me, and others think it was a gray. And there's always been a lot of speculation about what would the great Dwight D. Eisenhower have agreed with extraterrestrials for his very first communication with them as the leader of, I would say it was fair to consider the United States one of the top strongest countries at that time as it is today. What agreement would they have made? Now, I'm, pos I'm posing that almost rhetorically because the answer circles back to where I was a few minutes ago. It's from one source, information was presented to President Eisenhower having to do with non-humans who have been using our planet, been involved in DNA manipulation of already evolving primates, that the big picture was that the experimenters of Earth were trying to communicate and have some sort of an agreement that we wouldn't keep shooting at them or microwaving them, which could bring down their ships. So we had a little bit of rough edge to negotiate, but that in the end, Dwight Eisenhower, this is not proved, I'm saying this is what I understand was part of the discussion, that abductions of humans and mutilations of animals would be part of an agreement because both of those were necessary to the big picture of what the non-humans who were trying to negotiate or felt like they would go through the motions of negotiating had reason to go through all this is that they needed chemistries from our planet and that they were actively involved with continuing manipulation of genetic material. The details 
to that big picture, uh, I've never seen, I'd, I've never heard anybody lay them out, meaning, was it in words? How, how did this communication go? But certainly, there's no doubt that President Eisenhower and subsequent presidents were being, if you want to say, straight-jacketed by the MJ-12 organization that was done uh, in the Truman administration. Uh, Truman, I think it was September 18, 1947, that he brought into being uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, and it was not too far after that that he created MJ-12. So weave all those together. <laughs> well done, Linda. Okay. Uh, Lucky J, J, and Alan Thomas, 9292, they're both referring to a question that keeps coming up over and over with our audience, but it's a fascinating question. Linda, you mentioned on past shows about a cold, dark sea in the universe. Can you expand on what this is and its connection to us in the, and other species? And Lucky JJ says, is there more information about the cold, dark sea that surrounds us? Um... I have reached for this before. I wrote this about three years ago when we had done an Earth Files YouTube and the, I think I was quoting from my own work about when I first heard about the cold dark sea. And that goes all the way back to the 1983 to 85 time period because I was doing work on the East Coast and I ended up in all of the, the HBO special was still uh, open if certain ingredients came together and I was doing documentaries. I did one for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting on uh, how you weigh molecules by water, how you measure. I was doing still a lot of science and medical programming. And a, a person crossed my path while I was in production. Um, the crew had broken and I was sitting at a table and I was working on a script by myself alone. And what I remember is that the person quietly walked from a place to the left that I didn't know there was any place for anybody to come. I learned later there was like a little alcove that went between two parts of a building. And this man em emerged and he was wearing one of those raincoats that make people look like a detective in a movie. And he had a hat, it was creased up here, uh, like a gentleman's hat. And he looked like he came from, if that was in the 83, 85 time period, he looked like he came from the 1950s. And he did, I, I, this is another part, he walked toward me and he never asked, he didn't say my name, he just pulled the chair out from across from me at the table. He just pulled it out and sat down. And often I've wondered, God, I mean, when, when the world was so seemingly more peaceful that people could do that without somebody jumping up with a gun and shooting, <laughs> shooting instead, I only had my mind and my questions to ask what is going on. And this person pulled out some papers, showed me some material, told me that I was being watched and monitored, and that eventually, this is the key, that eventually that people were going to come to 
me through other intermediaries to talk about what the real big story was that we were in a universe that was programmed for the white and the dark, the yin and the yang, to always be struggling with each other as if being created, produced for some huge bigger box. Now, I don't know if the bell will give me the... T <laughs> well, maybe I can carry this over like a balance <laughs> into the next question. <laughs> now, I think, Ian, may I be given a dispensation to uh, pr put yes, forward this evidentiary, this evidentiary piece of paper that ties into this dramatic uh, scene that happened, to, it, it really happened in 83 to 85. Okay. Go for it. And this is something that I wrote because I think there is some truth in what he said, what the writers said through Ray Boucher and others. Quote, why isn't agape love the natural state of human to human on this planet? That's what the avatars were trying to accomplish. Avatars would be Krishna, Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, Joseph Smith. But power and barter prevailed then and now. Does the cold, dark sea that is supposed to surround this entire universe have a stranglehold on this particular cosmos? because this is truly a holographic Colosseum. Quote, close quote, me. I really think there is some profound truth. And it has become more and more a part of the way I'm reading things, looking at things, and I'll just boil it down to this. If there are truly trillions of universes, even billions, even millions of universes. How did they start? Why would they proliferate? And why would we be in a particular universe in which everything we know about the evolution of these humanoids, of which we now are a particular humanoid that is homo sapien sapien, why would we and others, the insects, the tall whites having to fight because of the insects, why are we self-destructive? Why are we in a universe in which it seems that there is always an edge of the white versus the black? If it's a holographic universe, as Michael Talbot wrote in his entire book, from ETs downloading the book to him, that we are in a holographic universe and that there are sides. There is the black and the white, and they are always working at each other and against each other, but that the bigger goal is to train souls to come out of this universe knowing why you avoid the dark and you go to the light. And then you are where the thought dwells in the light. And to me, that is the biggest divine presence. And to have product, produced a universe in which the black and the white are always fighting in order to teach souls in that context, the holographic universe is like a huge university to teach how to avoid the cold, dark sea. I rest my case for right now. <laughs> That's great, Linda. Thank you for that. I've got some questions on ET anatomy. Uh, first of all, Ima Enigma says, I wonder if humanoid like ETs have a heart, lungs and blood like us, do they breathe? But also John Bearer has a question. 
Have you been able to find out? Uh, no, I have to come back to that one. I'm sorry, I don't have his question there at the moment. Sorry, or some, someone else's. Let's deal with that first one. Yes, it's important. This is a very important question. There are documents that have been floating around since me, for me in the 1980s. And uh, Bob Wood assembled with his son Ryan the MJ-12 documents in a, about an inch a black and white book. I have, have it. I've read through it many, many times in specific documents. And in that work that was done around the MJ-12 documents, there came other information, which I have in another file, about there being autopsies and dissections done. And our human surgeons finding out <clears throat> that what they were cutting, it wasn't even skin. It is a biological chemical protection like having a skin suit on, you can't put a scalpel through it. That's how they first discovered that these bodies that look gray, they're gray skin suits for protection. And there is a very strong autopsy report. I used it three years ago, I think, uh, that a few, not very long after COVID really announced. Uh, I used it in one of our when we were do, trying to do conferences digitally, and it wasn't uh, easy to do, but I decided to share one of those documents that I had about the actual internal, what did the surgeon find that was dealing with the skin suit that he couldn't cut? What did they find? And they were not organs like us at all. And the conclusion was that they were uh, dealing with androids. They were dealing with something that had some kind of an artificial intelligence component. Could be biological and AI, that would be a cyborg. That they were actually dealing with things that had biological components and non-biological components. And that stuck out. <laughs> amid all of the various investigations when they had hard proof that they were dealing with bodies that were not purely biological. And jumping to 2024, today we, are, we go to conferences and you hear people talking, whether they're abductees or scientists or whatever, about the fact, yeah, yeah, a lot of it's AI. That was not so clear long ago. The fact that it has become clear and that there is a whole host of biology and AI behind the intelligences that are operating the ships, and in many cases the ships themselves are AI, and they really don't need the, the beings that are in. They can travel on their own, is my understanding. So there's a huge gulf between us homo sapiens sapien looking at what has been collected from technologies that no human has ever made and still do not understand. Who are the makers of those cyborgs? Now, when you start getting into those questions and where are the sources astronomically, that's when the rubber begins to hit the road about Okay, is there any clear map here of which ETs are truly hostile, no matter what they appear as? Because they shapeshift. They all can shapeshift. And that's another ingredient to this huge, gigantic mystery that humans so far can't just shapeshift, to my knowledge. <laughs> Done. That leads on nicely to the next question from Barber0611. Are interdimensional aliens flesh and blood or spirit? How does that work? From the biggest picture, they all exist. Anything and everything that you could ever ask a question about, it could conjure up in your mind any, any combination of biology and artificial intelligence, I think, is possible and 
could exist in this universe. When it comes to Earth's own history, the relationship between who was actually doing the manipulation of genetics on this planet and truly how long ago for real, the best voice, the best mind that I've ever heard on that subject is the De Defense Intelligence Agency analyst who was retiring from the DIA after 23 years of monitoring conflicting extraterrestrial civilizations and wanted to talk to me. And when he went over his analysis of the conflicts, he said, and this was a quote, I remember things sometimes because they stick in places and I visually see them. He said, they look at us and they say that for 278 million years, that was a firm number, that was actually refined for me from his discussion by another DIA person, and I sometimes think of them both together. So the first statement to me was, Linda, at least 270 million years ago, there were three conflicting extraterrestrial civilizations on this planet. There were reptilians, there were blondes, and there were greys, and they all fought each other. Another DIA person, knowing quite a bit about that conflict and issue, said the accurate date for the beginning of the full-scale conflict among the three extraterrestrial civilizations is 278 million. 278 million years ago. I've tried to find what would be, is there anything that would be kind of obvious in the Earth's history? And at 278 million, I'm not certain. But that kind of detail being known to our government and knowing that there's, that every lens that we must look at everything that is happening on this planet has to come through three lenses that are in conflict. And some of the conflict is over having manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. There is some kind of conflict over every part of it. And here we are. 8 billion now, and we have never ever been told the truth as a global population about what I'm telling you. I've had deep discussions with people who have worked in any of the military branches, CIA, NSA, DIA, uh, JSOC, and on and on. A whole hell of a lot of people really know a lot of details, and I'm not kidding. But everybody is afraid. Everybody is afraid to talk. Everybody is afraid that it will clash with religions. And everybody is afraid, just as David Grush said, and he was speaking truth, people have been murdered to keep all this quiet. JFK being at the top of the list, according to Jim Mars in his brilliant book. Has it changed? Is 2024 a safer year to be alive and report or not? Are they still strategizing about how to do another fairy tale explanation? And on that note, holding one thing back here, I'm going to swing back to you, Ian, because the bell rang. But I have another piece to add at some point. Sure. I just want to get some uh, acknowledgments as well for our Super Chats, for our generous audience this evening. So here we go. Thank you to Moonbird, Terry, 
Captain Kirk, Kurt, sorry, MB, Camp Freedom, who says classified reality, you nailed it, Linda. Red Sox, Quezira Maria, Juan Arlini, Mike Basil, John Michael, Yin Yang Glo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I love all of you and the fact that our, um, we'll call it our Earth Files world family keeps growing and growing and growing. I can't, I just couldn't ask for anything more and just hope you will keep telling everybody that you know to keep coming and subscribing and attending because that helps. And I feel, I, as so many of you do, because you write, I feel that we're, opening up a space here at the Earth Files YouTube channel that people are respectful and they really, really think this is important to have this space for this information. So on that note, Ian, I'm with Yeah, we've got Tom the Man TV in the chat tonight. He's a regular here and he has a question. Why were there two Dreamland programs created? Now, what he's talking about here, I think, uh, relate to his own experiences of perhaps a government or government and ET liaison program involving children at a very early age. And some people have this, this sort of like a memory of, a, of a, a being involved in a government program as a child with uh, testing and finding out certain abilities and also interacting with ETs. I think it's safe to say that my estimate of the number of people that I have talked to over the last 46 years, going back to 1979, did I do that right? 45 years, 46, somewhere, 45, 46, are exactly that. They remember, I'll, I'll take all of them down to one that is really clear. Uh, this was a male. Most of them were male. And he said that when he was approximately, he thought at first he was nine to ten years old. Later on, he said, I'm not sure if that was, I was nine to ten or twelve to thirteen, but he said that that was the year generally, the years generally. And that, uh, a school principal came to him and said that there were some people who worked with our government in our country and uh, that they wanted to be able to talk with some school children and it was all very nice and chirpy and positive and uh, that they wanted him to go into a room and that they would be showing images and it was going to be a contest. And this is great, and the kids could win. And in this case, because of where he lived, he lived in the state of Ohio, the, the win would be being taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where the winner of this child contest would be able to see planes and various things at Wright-Patterson. And he said, it all seemed fine. And he went with these people. And they went to a room that had been somehow set up for whatever this was. And inside the room, there were some men. And they had a lot of books and notebooks and all kinds of stuff. And they said, here's a screen. And we're going to put pictures and maybe some movies on the screen. All you have to do, this is all we want, as soon as you know what you're looking at, just tell us. That's all. Just tell us. And he said, it started out, picture, picture, picture. And he would be giving names and then... And then so fast that he said what was on the screen became a blur. And they stopped because he stopped being able to answer what he was seeing. But somebody said, 
thank you very much. You went about the longest that we have ever seen anybody be able to do this. You might be a winner. And he was, and he was taken to Wright Patterson, and he was shown a lot of things, but he told me, ever since then, he received one other contact later and this is how he came to tell me this, which I don't have proof for, but I've heard this from other people, not in the detail of this particular individual, that they were looking for humans who could have telepathic communication with extraterrestrials. I almost made it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm being very serious that that was the... That was what he learned. And that's why he was at this UFO conference where I was speaking. I don't know about other people checking in. Uh, I would be very interested, uh, Ian, if others have any similar stories or any similar knowledge. Yeah, well, share them with us. And don't forget, you can always email us directly as well at earthfiles at earthfiles.com. We welcome your experiences and contributions via the email. And I want to uh, also tell everyone and remind everyone that this program and all of our programs are available as a podcast wherever you get yeah. your podcasts from too. Yes. And do you have uh, information about Conscious Life and uh, the Sedona upcoming? Yeah, I've been uh, posting those in the chat as we go. Conscious Life Expo, the dates are February the 9th to the 12th. And we posted the links there. If people use the links, they can get a, a discounted price on tickets, etc., and discounted price on hotels. Also, the Sedona Ascension Retreat is March 8th to the 10th. And we're publishing the links there. Also, if you use a coupon code for the Sedona Ascension Retreat, uh, Earth Files, that's the coupon code Earth Files, you get a 10% discount on that one too. And you're going to be at Sedona, right? Yeah, I'm I'm more booked up for uh, Los Angeles for the, the Conscious Life Expo and things are coming together. I was just making accommodation uh, um, inquiries today about the Sedona retreat. So yes, I'm hopeful to be there as well and I look forward to meeting all of our audience. Come on over, come and say hello to us and spend time with us. And as Linda says, let's have those long chats and keep those uh, questions coming as yes. we talk well into the night. Yes. And first up next is Conscious Life Expo. And I leave uh, this coming, uh, what is the, the 8th? The, I'll be there 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, because I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing two lecture workshops. Uh, I'm doing panels. I'm doing a two and a half hour intensive on Monday, which I think is the 12th. And uh, the, the, we'll say the lectures yeah. are about areas of my own investigations, which I have felt especially important to present at this time after f nearly half a century, um, that I think they're two of the very most important I've ever done. And the two and a half hour workshop is going to be my first time actually going deeper and deeper and deeper into we sh what we should we say, the precious whispers that I have on papers from people over the years in which now I can see what they were talking about and I have current information that fleshes them out. So I think there's going to be really important content at uh, Sedona, which uh, is a whole other subject on everything it comes down to frequencies. But at Conscious Life, I'm, I'm really going deep into some subjects that I hope people will be there. And you know what, That's right. Ian? Yes? as you and Brad and I talked about at the beginning before we started, I thought uh, before we would close out that I wanted to share 
one of dozens of emails, proton mails, handwritten mails. Some people even cut uh, stuff out of newspapers and put them together in sentences, I guess because they're still afraid. And this is from a former Navy instructor. He was teaching harpoon weapon systems and what is known as the MK-15 CIWS operation, which when you look that up, it is military language for providing ships of the U.S. Navy with an inner layer point defense capability against anti-ship missiles, aircraft, and littoral warfare threats that have penetrated other fleet defenses. This, this technology detects, evaluates, tracks, engages, and performs kill assessment against the anti-ship missiles and high-speed aircraft threats. So this is a person who has worked with a lot of this high-tech American military technology. As part of my job, I was a highly trained U.S. Navy observer, both visually and electronically. Fire controlmen are charged with observing and tracking all threats or possible threats to our ships and the fleet. Our motto was, in God we trust, all others we track. I still try to keep in touch with the latest military technology that will let the general public know about it. Back to 1972-74, I was with a bunch of other young people. We were playing football in an open field next to a Holiday Mobile home park in Jacksonville, North Carolina, close to the main gate at Camp Lejeune Marine Corps Base. My father was on active duty waiting to retire. As I recall, it was an overcast day with some rain. At the same time, I was 10 to 12 years old and not experienced with anything, no alcohol, no drugs, nothing. But all of a sudden, we all saw what I would, would describe as a blue transparent ball of light moving from left to right at a very low observable speed. We as kids were in awe and hypnotized by this. I had the feeling that we were being watched the object was about 100 feet above a group of pine trees, and then it slowly moved in the same direction and altitude for about 20 yards, stopped, and started to ascend at a position angle of approximately 25 to 40 degrees. And then it slowly started to gain altitude, and in a blink of an eye, it increased speed at such a point it was gone. This object made no sound. I am now 61 years old and a true believer in UAPs and ETs. At the time this happened, it was light years ahead of anything we had in our military, military inventory at that time. I believe in UAPs and am quite sure we have alien technology at Area 51 that we are reverse engineering to give us the edge in the technological arena Bob Lazar is not making anything up. I believe his whole account. Thanks again, Linda, for the awesome reporting on the subject that I am a believer and a big fan. Thank you. He signed Wild Bill. It's a simple communication from somebody who worked at high sophistication in military and technology in our government. And they, many 30, 40 years later, they knew that they were dealing with and knew about other technologies. And they're still frustrated today that it's not public. And so they send these non-threatening to their life or career or post-career, these kinds of notes, which to me send the signal we know, Linda, we know that what you are talking about is true. And on that note, dear Earth Files, feel, feel, feel.
an agape hug from the Greeks. I love all of you for being here. Keep coming. We'll keep exploring. And I hope a bunch of you will come up to me at Conscious Life Expo uh, soon and to Sedona in March and that we could all have face-to-face -face discussions at these two fun upcoming conferences. I love you and I'll see you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been